Well-behaved women never make history. Welcome to the Forge by Trust podcast. I'm your host, Robin Dreek, executive coach, former U.S. Marine, spy recruiter, best-selling author, and your trust and communication expert. Today's episode, The Human Polygraph, is with the force of nature, Susan Ibitz, and what she can do for you at the Human Behavior Lab. Susan works to help people to be their best version of themselves. She teaches you how to profile anyone in 90 seconds over the phone, a picture, video call, or in person, either in her online classes where you can jump in anytime at your own pace or in a group training, or you can hire her to do one-on-one coaching. She will teach you a superpower to have the life you always wanted, the income that you dreamed about, and she can take you wherever you want to go. Coming up next on the Forge by Trust podcast. I was a rebel. Years later, I understand that I was overcompensating for my dyslexia and my autism. There are three ways you can be good in this job. Who you are, how you feeling, and how predisposed you are not to drink your own Kool-Aid and walk in a room thinking everybody have a reason, everybody's telling you the truth. I just want to know if you're lying and go with the flow. Welcome to the show. I'm Robin Dreek. And on the Forged by Trust podcast, we decode the interpersonal communication skills of the world's most acclaimed forgers of trust. We unlock the skills and techniques from spies, spy recruiters, master interrogators, globally recognized behavioral experts, C-suite executives, entrepreneurs, acclaimed authors, and thought leaders. Each episode provides specific actions that you can immediately apply to any aspect of your personal or professional life. Today's episode, The Human Polygraph, is with Susan Ibitz. Susan Ibitz is a human behavior hacker. Some people hack computers, she hacks humans, and has so much fun doing it. Susan is a profiler, civilian hostage, crisis negotiator, trainer, face reading profiler, trial consultant, and she's traveled around the world chasing the best of the best, studied with Paul Ekman International in the UK, Microexpression and deception detection, persuasion with Cialdini, and statement analysis with Sapir. And he is the man who developed what others are teaching. Susan holds over 30 certifications, including Harvard Law School, civilian hostage negotiator, level three, and face reading profile, and is still going. During the episode today, we talk about curiosity, dyslexia, and autism as a gift, becoming the human polygraph, three keys to reading behavior, and how to be present for others. Susan, all I can do is say, hello, welcome to Forge by Trust. And as we were just chatting before and the numerous chats we've had, yes, you are known as a human polygraph, human behavior expert, but I got to tell you what, I think your real superpower is making me laugh. (laughs) So anyway, thank you. And thank you for joining me today. I hope people have as much fun as we have on the prep and during the show. And I expect that because laugh and smiling elevate oxytocin and we elevate dopamine. Those are the bonding hormones. So let's say we're going to be geeky fun if it's possible. <laughs> geeky fun, hormone inducing fun. Yes, absolutely. So kind of going back to what I just said, as you know, and as my audience knows, there's nothing better in life than a great story and a great backstory. And especially since we all love human behavior, especially since you are an expert in polygraph as you're the human polygraph. I'm curious, what was a spark all those years ago that inspired you to, to really follow and make human behavior your passion? Failing. Tell I didn't have plan B. And it was the, fir- the best thing that happened to me was failure. And I don't remember who says the phrase, but mistaken failure is you don't learn anything from it. And at young age, and I always say the same story, my dad, we live in quality time, not quantity time with the four kids. He was a diplomat doing something completely different. He never, he finished barely high school because he lost his And where his was dad. this? I'm so sorry. Where was this? My dad was in Argentina, uh, first generation to Calabres, Italian Calabres, not simple Italian Calabres in Argentina, and he was an artist, and he was called to go around the world recovering a stolen art from the Nazis, because my dad met my mom, who is the first generation of Auschwitz survivors. My my grandmother came. Hold on, I I got us. There is so much here. I already got us. Oh, I can pull a lot. (laughs) What kind Mm. of artist was he? He studied with Petoruti and Picasso. Actually, some of the arts in my house, people says, oh, this is a Picasso. No, that is my dad. And actually have a painting. Then, you know what? My dad was a storyteller. 
And he was a dreamer. He was an doer. I always says, I love my dad to death that he was always on the verge to be broke because he, he dreamed all the time. And where did your dad grow up? My dad grew up in a small town called Villa Maria Cordova in the north part of Argentina. That when he grew up, he lost his dad when he was three months old. My grandmother was 21 with two kids. Italian family, she wore black until she was 40. Wow. Crazy. Yep. So, and what, what sparked his passion for art when he was so... It was his way to communicate. Uh, remember, this was on the 20s or 30s. I, my yeah. dad should be 95 now. He died 45 years ago. Yeah. So it was a long time ago. So his grandfather, I think... All my family lineage, both sides, are really remarkable by the grandparents. In my case, my grandmothers and my dad grandfather, he used to like old school is like do, I don't know how you name it in any other language than Spanish, rulemanes. There are those, the little wheels that you have with metal. So his grandfather used to do like big skateboards with wheels. So he can be pulled by the bike from another person. Okay. So my dad has spent a lot of time with that. And my grandmother was an artist, my, my dad, mom. But being an artist, it was being a prostitute. You cannot be a woman and an artist if you're a widow. So my grandmother and start painting, hiding from her parents and from society. And that was the quality time between my dad and my grandmother. Huh. When she was hiding at night, painting and she was a couture designer and my sense of styles so always says oh you have a good sense of style i know i have two grandmothers they have a really good sense of style so she was a couture designer during the day and she was a painter at night and my dad and my grandmother has carolina have that moment when she was painting and the smell of the paint was a connection to him so he started painting on the floor and my grandmother started putting pieces of canvas for him to paint he had the chance to go to europe and that's where he studied and i think was in he studied with picasso and one of the paintings that i have in one of my walls my dad always says it was, it's an original picasso and my investment advisor says we need to make it like assess he says you know what i don't care if it's a picasso it's the fantasy that i spend hours and days with my dad in his studio telling me the story about the painting if it's not you're going to take part of my childhood it's not about the money we're not going to sell it right, i'm going right, to leave right. it to my niece and nephews they can assess it's part of my story it's part of my storytelling it's part of my quality time with my dad since i was five years old and says what do you want me to be yours when you move out and says that painting so we built a story through that painting so Maybe have a Picasso and I can't retire. No idea, but I'm keep it on the wall. Wow. So how do you get into going around the world and finding art had been stolen from the Jews? And it's crazy because my dad wasn't a diplomat and actually going through things with my brother when we lost my mom two years ago, we found out the business car of my dad with the seal. Actually, he was a consul. It's consul, the diplomat was mm -hmm. a consul as an art from Guatemala to around the world. So not even in Buenos Aires. So it was one of his connections. My dad had a really good sense of art, like more artists are clueless and useless on marketing and selling themselves. But he loved art and he was really good. Actually, he died at the age of 90, managing a foundation for new artists to make sure they are support and they can expose. So... He was a natural. He was a really good artist. He was so prolific that when he died, we need to hire four trucks to get his art in a warehouse to be preserved to see how the heck we're going to, because we live in all around the world. All my brothers and sisters and nephew, nobody's on Argentina. We're all over the world. How are we going to make sure that we can get that art and bring it with us? So we decide to put it in a warehouse. We need to get four trucks to transport all the art. My dad was doing two paintings a week. And I remember he's sitting in front of the white canvas and the joke is, I haven't talked to you yet. Like, shh, the canvas is talking to me and deciding what she wanna be or he wanna be like, okay, let's go for it. So I'm not insane. It's genetic predisposition. My parents were <laughs> right. 
I'm already laughing. Okay, I'm Jewish. I'm not going to be ever good in a sport. We're good in, in therapy. I need to blame my parents. Come on. <laughs> That's what we're supposed to do. Who are you going to be blaming? Your parents. That's what you do. Right. Okay. So we come up through childhood with an amazing backstory and storyteller of a father who's an artist. What were you aspiring to do at that age? I wanted to be the first female astronaut until I found out it was one. It says, nope, I'm not interested anymore. I was, you know what? What And inspired a, you want to be an astronaut? Oh, because nobody else has done it at that point. I was a rebel. My dad sent me to ballet and I didn't want it. My mom decided to shape my head for the first time when I was six years old and five years old. And I was in kindergarten because I was fighting with the boys. And I always have pieces of hair missing. And I never was the proper lady. I was kicked out of the school until they finally put me in a Catholic kindergarten because my parents were paying so much money. They didn't kick me out. So what were you fighting about? I was a rebel. I didn't feel that I belong. I like to play why? with, I didn't want to be playing with dolls. They give me dolls. I'm like, why? Why they can go out and make money? I need to wait at home. At what age were you saying that? <laughs> Four or five years old when you go to kindergarten says, we're going to play mom and dad. Like, I don't want to be mom. My not, my mom was really worried until I was 15. I have my, my best, my first boyfriend. Like, oh, she's not going to be gay. And like, and what is the problem if I am? Because all my friends were boys and my dad have, and he was racing polo horses and cows and things like that. And when I went to the, 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 with, on the summers with my parents there, I wasn't wearing a t-shirt. I only was in shorts and we got the short hair. Everybody was under the impression that I was a dude. Until what summer, I, these ladies come up and like, oh, You're not a dude. I was really, really horrible as a kid. And I think one of the reasons that I don't have kids is because I was afraid they're going to come up like me. And I'm like, no, it's not going to happen. I was a rebel. And I, years later, I understand that I was overcompensating for my dyslexia and my autism because I didn't understand. And I was told too many times I was a stupid. I was slow, blah, blah, blah. And it was overcompensated. So it was, I was more aggressive than more other kids around. And I never felt that I can feed on other people's expectations. My dad, an artist, my mama, former stewardess, that's how my parents met, teacher for special kids. My house was full of artists. They were smoking weed. They were the 70s. Hello. You know what it was that? Studio 65, uh, 60, I think 65 in New York 64. was nothing compared to my house. Right. So nobody, nothing was normal. For me, it was normal. I love it. My mom, dad was the second marriage for both. I have brothers and sisters from the oldest, from the first marriage of my dad. Guess what? When they get married, the former mom says, they're yours. I don't want these kids. They're terrible. So I grew up with my brothers and sisters from the first marriage on the 70s remember south america in the 70s wasn't being with so when people says how is your family my brother and sister my mom my mom one my mom two my grandmother one two three and four and my dad and they call my parents like your daughter is something hit on the head like no that's our family We have four, 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 but we have family all around the world. So I never feed on that criteria. And I love the chance that my parents gave me. They didn't leave me money, but they gave me wings. We were an Orthodox. Now you can see families, integrated families. I don't know how they call it. I don't not go with pronouns or names, but I have an integrated family 51 years ago when they didn't exist. Right. My parents were super open about those things. And I love that. I crazy love that. So you said something that was interesting. They said they gave you wings. How'd they do that? What were the wings? My dad let me think. We're going to go with the quality time with my dad. He have a huge studio. And one of the things that I love about my books, actually, I found out that I can ta have tax exempt for the amount of books that I have. I didn't know that. I'm a public library. 
<laughs> if you have more than 2,000 books, you can apply for li public library. So I remember books and paintings on the roof and spending. You have over 2,000 books? Yeah, more than wow. that. And that, so, and that came from your dad, the passion? You no, know, I bought, I've traveled around the world. So these are new books. And actually, I have a spreadsheet when I lend you a book, I write and I send a reminded email that says, you own to Susan Ivitz Live Public Library two books due in 10 days. And my friends are like, are you kidding me? Like, no, don't mess with my books because I have books, the people that I study, Paul Ekman, Avino and Sapir, Cialdini, they're signed especially for me. Those books are do not lend them. I have a right. second pair of books that I can lend, but they're my treasure. Right. Because for years I didn't read, I didn't enjoy it because of my dyslexia. Now I find out that I can read it and listen to books. So for me, are my treasure. There are the things that I never could have conquered. And my dad was an avid reader. He sometimes go to the studio. He's a studio on Friday. And he doesn't show up until Sunday morning and talking about and spend all Sunday talking about the book he read. What kind of books did he read? He loved history. He was fascinated. The I was, I was a pilot for Hitler, Odessa, all that part, genetics. He loved genetics. Actually, when in his ranch, he allowed the first insemination for genetics done in South America on his on, on one of the cows and one of the ships. Genetic history, real history, because he didn't have the chance to go to college or the uni. He read about everything, culture, uh, biographies. He loved biographies. And he loved biographies about people different perspective i would have put it like the democrats and republicans about the same aspect in, in in the world he loved that he loved knowledge but not the traditional knowledge right. he says everybody do the, his own path so growing up with those things a grandmother who escaped from auschwitz one who was widow at the age of 21 with two kids traditional italian family who become an artist just when she turned 40 how are you going to become all of that people around the world? All those people, my people, my family did their things in their own way. There's no way I'm going to be following the path. And my dad never allowed us to work, to do any sport professionally until we were 18. Mm. I was supposed to be on the volleyball team. He says, no, my daughter is not going to spend five days, five times a week, two hours every day playing professionally she need to play she need to be a kid my brother the same he didn't allow us to do anything until we decide what we're going to become religion last name activities nothing need to be professional one be obliged beside what we're going to do he took mm -hmm. me to ballet one day he says susan my mom was susan too she's not going to keep doing ballet why she doesn't like it well, what she knows, like, she doesn't like it. She's not going to do it. Move move on. She's going to choose what she's going to do. And my time was going to the ranch. Riding, I learned riding horses before I ride, I ride a bike. And I spent all day with between the pigs, riding horses, feeding the cows. I love it. I love that. that the, one of the reasons I live in the forest now is that connection with my dad. And he always told me, do whatever you want. The only limit is yourself. Nobody can tell you can't do it. And if you want to do it, just find a way to do it. Don't be so lazy to blame in others on a condition you cannot get done. Susan, did you know your grandmother that was in Auschwitz well? Yes. She never told the story. I found out. You know how I found out? Yeah. My my mom first husband was Jewish. My grandmother buried four husbands and they died at the age of 103. That lady had a lot of fun. And my brother, it's true. My brother married a Jewish lady and I ended up marrying a Jewish guy. We agreed we're not going to have kids, but I want to convert to Judaism. And I went to the painful effort for a year to study. I went to visit my parents in South America. They used to live in a small town in the beach. And my mom says, "Why are you? What are those? All those books? Like, oh, mom, I have the conversion next week. I need to give the test." And she says, "If you don't tell anyone, I'm going to tell you. You're Jewish." And like, what the heck? What? And that's when she told me the story. And like, so you saw me suffering for a year going through this study, knowing how hard. And we're Jewish. Says, 
your grandmother want to say anything like, what were the cr crosses and going to a Catholic school? Why you did that to me? I never fed. It's because your grandmother is still thinking that she that she's afraid they're going to come up and take it. So I tried to talk to my grandmother a couple of times and she says, I don't know what you're talking about. So finally, at the age of 33, 34, I went to Austria for a couple of months until finally, like, good, that's where we're coming from. So I hired a private investigator and through different museums and organizations, finally, I found my grandmother's sister buried in Barcelona with the name Ruth Ivitz. And like, that's who I belong to. So I came back to the United States. I went back to South America. This conversation need to happen with my dad in person says, I found who I belong to. I love you to death and nobody's going to change. I'm your daughter. So I'm going to change my last name. My dad looked at me and the glasses and looked at me and said, honey, with that face, everybody knows you're my daughter. Do whatever you want. You always have. And he never talked about it again. And that's how I want to become Susan Ivitz. I changed my last name to my legal. I'm the last person on the family who keep that Jewish name. Wow. And my, grandmother, my grandmother died without telling the story. So I have pieces and bits yeah. for the survivors. And it's really common for survivors that they were afraid to tell the story. And she did. And at one point, I stopped fighting and I started respecting because right. I own to be who I am to my two grandmothers. Widow at 21, Auschwitz survivor, dressed as a man on the bottom of a boat. Hello, I own the two ladies not to give up. And every time that I says to my grandparents, I, I fail, they look at me like, really? Okay, I'm not going to fight. Just was the really. What we went through for you having all this option. You complain about a guy didn't pick up your phone number. You're complaining that you're not doing well in a school. Hello, grow up. It's not another way. They give you wins. They give you stronger I always says if I was born and raised in the United States, probably seek secret service. Social service would take me and take me away from my parents. I'm so happy I was born and raised in South America until I was 17. So what do we want to do? So we wanted to be an astronaut. That wasn't happening. So what, what did happen? Mm. My college time with my dad was watching Colombo and the reading Godfather and the stories about the family in Italy. And my dad was like, who you think is the, is, is the, is the murder? What happened? And reading mystery stories. And my dad make me think, okay, this happened. And we have what I call Wyborn now. And we tell stories. And like, who do you think? Or hiding things. Or made me think all the time. So you were, it. so you took these mysteries from Colombo and these other things and put them on whiteboards with your dad? Yes. I was there's, on the, I'm telling the you. There's the right there. That's amazing. It's genetically crazy. I tell my therapist who I can blame. Your parents, good to go. We can and, go. And, and so I'm curious, also, Susan, because you were so visual because of dyslexia, mm -hmm. was that was that natural then to put it on the board? It was easier to do. I mean, tell me about that. My dad was right in the clues, so it was early signs. But my parents wasn't educated on the traditional way to understand what happened with their kids, and at least with me. And one of the things is, I remember when I told my mom, I found out that I'm dyslexic when I was 17 and I was autistic when I was 35 and studying in London. And my mom says, my daughter is neither of those things. And it took me a long time to say, mom, it's not a reflection on you, it's who I am. And I'm so happy that I have those things. The only thing I regret is not knowing earlier to have down the path that I want, but every life through your ball, you need to learn to catch it and go for it. So my dad, like, oh, Susan, you're too lazy. They call me Suki. My parents call me Suki and my grandmother call me Bella, the Italian, because my second name is Bethlehem. Huh. So he called my grandma, the Italian grandmother called me Bella, the other part of family, Suki. Suki, okay, I'm going to write it for you. What do you think it happened? I think the murderer is the guy on the red shirt. So we did visually. He helped me to go visual. It wasn't Robert. It was the guy with the red shirt. That's the way I can visualize. Hmm. And we have, and sometimes he leaves the whiteboard and says, you have until Sunday to discover who killed it or who did it or who stole it or who took it. And he would tell me stories and like, what do you think it happened? So we, we went through that exercise without knowing 
who I am today is that time that I have with my dad. So I grew up thinking what I'm going to be or who I'm going to be or what I'm going to be doing because how a dream can become a career. So when I was 15, again, thank God I don't have kids. I tell to my parents that college, high school was going too slow. So I'm going to take a year sabbatical and go to the library for eight hours a day to study on my own. The crazy is not that I propose it. The nuts is they say yes. <laughs> so start going to the library to study. And okay, I'm ready to go back. What did you want the, to study? I was reading everything that you can put in front of me. I was studying law by Lafont. Lafont is introduction to civil rights and law. And, how, and I'm so sorry, Susan. How were you able to do this with the dyslexia? How was that going for you? I didn't know. It's like telling a person that is blind that not everybody else is blind. You cope, you have coping mechanisms. Okay. So I was hearing so many times that I was lazy, then I read slower. And I have a, the famous tape recorder. I remember my mom gave me, when I asked when I would turn the sweet 16, was a tape recorder. So it was recording my readings. And at that point, you have some tape recordings, readings. So I was grabbing everything that it was in tape on the, on the public library. You do an audible, right. And what I did is I went to the blind library where they have all these tape recorders for blind people. Oh my gosh, that's brilliant. And I was going there and the woman says, why you got, because it's easy for me to listen and read. And says, why don't you go to the blind library? They have a bigger selection of a story. And think like, what am I? <gasps> and I remember go to the library says, how much? And I remember collecting my lunch money for like two weeks to pay for my membership on the blind library to be able to listen to those tapes. And I was so happy. And I actually, I have a good span. I don't know if you can see it. Yeah, yeah. Because it was like my aha moment. Like, oh my God, all this is mine. I can read all this. I got goosebumps oh too. <laughs> and when you're 15, you're not supposed to be doing that. But it was that curiosity. Yeah. Take me to another place. Go to like, what happened? I remember Sor Juan Inés de la Cruz. She was a nun in Mexico. And I found out because they have all these audio tapes. They're coming from Mexico as a nation. And I found out Sor Juan Inés de la Cruz, she dressed as a man to, when she was a nun to be allowed to study history, physiognomy. That's why the first time I hear face reading on the all terms physiognomy, physics, astronomy. And they found out 10 years later, she was a woman. And she wrote one of the most amazing poems. Men, you're men who are so blind to understand that you are punishing women when you become from women. It's way more lovely in Spanish, but it was like I was reading La Cruz. I was reading about Queen, the, the, the Golden Age. I was reading about, oh my God, the one who killed herself. They said really good. Oh my God, I'm really bad with names. Uh, Eva Duarte. I was reading oh, yeah. about this women figures and like was so empowering and what it mean and that take me to another Eva Brown the one who was Jewish and married with Hitler before she died right. so all these empowered women later I found out about Margaret Thatcher in the 80s when England went against Argentina for the folks folks and so all these women like look what they did look who they become and Maria Curie yeah. so it was empowering to listen to that. And that's how my brain developed to be, to make the impossible possible for only one formula because you want it to happen. Right. So when, yeah, it sounds horrible, but when I find out the blind library, it was like my aha moment. And I did that for many, many years around the world. Wow. And I still do it sometimes when some languages, now we have audible. I have more than 223 books. Up today, I check it before this morning because my phone that says you need a memory update. I'm like, why? Oh, I have too many books. Uh, you see, the only thing I regret to be born as late is for the understanding with your education limitations right. and the tools, the technology. I don't have any problem with technology. You yeah. said in your favor, everybody loves a cell phone, so don't complain about technology. Is that technology was? I'm not taking about thirty years ago, twenty years ago. 20, only 20, not only five. Audible is six years. I, I, Robin, what is five, six years old? 
I only discovered about two years ago. So I think it's about five years old. All right. So we're feeling really good. We're empowered. We unlocked the secret to our curiosity. Mm -hmm. What was next? And actually, many years later, I don't know if you know Dr. Diane Hamilton. Yes. She, oh, my gosh. The curiosity code. Cracking the curiosity code. I had her on my show. I love her. Yes. Ah, we love Diane. Diane and I, we become really good friends, at least on my side. Let's, let's ask her. And I read her book and a first version of the curiosity code, like many years ago when she wrote it with her huh? because of her daughter. The first version, that's how I contact Diane. She had in her show. And one of the tomorrow I'm going to do my mental health certification. The next one is Diane curiosity so that curiosity actually i was looking for a definition what it, i'm not intelligent i'm not better than anybody else i'm a regular chick with a couple of certification and a huge huge amount of curiosity mm -hmm. that is when kids are curious and parents says no 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 i don't have time please from all the things you says no not be that when the why i never grow when the three years old why why, why? I don't want to grow up if I'm going to lose to be curious and I'm going to lose to ask why. Okay. So how come you never lost your curiosity? We're all born with it. Uh, really? What I don't know. It? I mean, I, I was punched so many times. I always says, I always run for the first place and I always come in third. So <laughs> the only way, the, the only fate that I have, then I'm going to come from th for third place to first is to be curious how I can improve. Improving is a curiosity. Become better in what you do is a curiosity. Losing weight is to be curious. Reading new books is to be curious. Finding the way to be a better person, leave them better when they met you than before. That is curious. How curious I, was your dad? I curious. They gave me that. I was telling you, I yeah. take in the mental health training certification because i'm a horrible empath and i cannot sit in my own life saying oh because i'm not an empath and i don't connect emotionally with your emotional pain oh i am who i am so i'm not going to change no i need to rationalize so i use the tools that i have to learn skills that are not natural with me ignorance is not to understand that other people have another needs that i have and they need to talk to another way so I use my left brain, my curiosity to try to rationalize. Most people is going to criticize me for that, but at least I make the effort to be rational with those empath. So when somebody needs to be receiving empathy and understanding, whatever use tools I use, at the end, you're going to have the end come that you need me to listen the way you need to be listened. Why? Because I was curious until I found a way to be better empath and better human being. And I now the tools that I use are different, but it still is the curiosity who get me to find out that I can do that certification. All right. So we're curious. We've unlocked our internal power. Keep me going. Where did the human behavior passion come from? Simple. When I was, when I came back to the, 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 the high school, I remember Dr. Frisco, my physics teacher, he says, I don't want you in my class anymore. You're a pain in the neck. He was a little more explicit. So <laughs> the other teacher said the same. You're disrupting. Why? I came in with all this knowledge. And when they talk about geography, oh, because this and this and this, I have a really good memory. This and this and this, Susan. Tone it down, land the plane. It's a simple high school class. No, but you know that, black Susan, you don't need to memorize things. Move on. So my mom was called to the school and my parents says, what you have done again? I swear to God this time, nothing. So the principal of the school says, your, da your daughter has been expelled from high school with a diploma. And my parents, what? No teachers want her. They're going to make a general examination orally because that's the kind of school I went. And if she passed, she have the paper. She can do whatever you want. And my parents are like, she's 16. What she, the heck is she going to be doing? Like, your problem. She's going to pass. I took the test a week later. I didn't pass what I would say. Oh, I passed 100. No, I passed with 61. I need to pass with 60. I was good enough. Oh, hey. And like, now what? So I went to I went to the uni. I was registered in law, philosophy, sociology, and psychology. High achiever. 
I went first year. I was Why did you want to do those things? Because when I did, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't tell you. When I was doing the, the, the orientation, I, the guy says, what are you going to do? And like, we went to a couple of meetings, like, I don't know what you're going to do. And so it says, tell me what you want to do when you was 13 years old. And I found out that everybody ended up being happy when they do what they want to do between 12 and 15. Maybe not an astronaut, but I was a dreamer. I was trying to conquer for the stars. And a philosophy way, that's what I did, conquer for the stars. Conquer to be what is untouchable, being a profiler, being a hostile negotiator, being all the things that I am, being a civilian. That was touching the stars with my hands. Huh. So it says, well, you want to be like, oh, I did it with my dad, blah, blah, blah. Oh, you want to be a profiler? You want to work for the FBI? Like, wait a minute, time out. I can get paid to do this? Yes. This is what I need to study. So we went through at that point, not phone calls and getting people and talking with people. It says, if by the age of 24, you get your first master in any of these specialties and you study English, you're willing, you're able to apply for the FBI and a special visa to go and train in Quantico and see what happened. And like, we have a plan. Now what I want to do? One of my teachers and psychologists says, Susan, I want to propose you to be my assistant in introductions to psych- psychology and danger personality and that manipulation, all the things, but your papers are from a five years old. Something is going on disconnected. So he sent me to a career advisor, social worker. And after they test me, I remember, and I'm going to say literally in part of my French, if you need to put a beep, honey, honey, 17 years old. The bad, the good news is you're hot. So you need to start, you need to look for a husband and popping kids because the bad news, you're highly dyslexic. You're never going to make it. I'm like, what? What What you mean I'm never going to make it? Like, no, all your dreams. So get a good husband. So I remember turning around and this, can you see my rear end? Good, because it's the last thing you're going to see about me. And I walk away. I went home and I remember not dating not of one of my proud moments, but that's how you deal with and cope with pain. I never, I don't have a recollection. I think it was too painful to remember. It was just two or three weeks. I didn't date. I didn't eat. I didn't want to get out of bed. That was start smoking. I was a, a, like a downfall. And my dad says, first, take a bath because I'm going to burn the couch with the, the, the mattress with you on it. I'm going to be in the studio. And my dad says, how do you think I get here and I put food in the table and roof in your head? Not because I was tall, it's going to happen. Not because it was easy. So you have two ways to get to the destination. Somebody fly first class and somebody's going to be swimming with sharks and look like you're going to be swimming with sharks all the way to the top. So your mom and I, we decide we're going to give you the, what is the, when the emancipation, Mm -hmm. we're going to give you as much money as we can Pack what you have and decide where you're going to go. So I found that that it was the first initial body language class in Belgium. So this is, I'm going to go to Belgium. Okay. When you made it there, no idea what's going to happen. And we need to remember 35 years ago, 34 years ago, we didn't have the problem that if you're visa, you're illegal, 9-11, those things that make more difficult to stay right. there. So I went to Belgium. I get my class, a year class. There was allowed to take it, and I was bartender at night. So one of the people that was studying with me and says, you have this weird brain that allow you to see people and you get to people's head. You make people laugh. You make people talk. And says, I do political consulting. Do, well, will you like to be shadowing me? And says, I says, how much you pay? You pay more than the bartender I'm in. At that point, I want to do it. I was... I think around 18, 25, I ran my first political campaign. I never stopped. And I did that for 18 years. What do you think they saw when they saw you that made them want to bring you on board? I think he was in Latin and he was an American. Europeans have another je ne sais quoi to see people. Uh, I was accepted to do a master in Manchester without having a degree because they saw something in me. What did I see? I know, no. And you know what? He died a couple of years ago and it was one of the biggest loss because without him, I wouldn't be who I am today. 
he observed me and I remember he says, you're a weirdo, you're a cripple. I need to be paying attention to you. He was observing me and observing me how I interact with others. And he was provoking situations where I need to be an exposed situation, situations with other and how I manage those. And like, why that happened? Tell me more. It was natural because I'm coming from a surviving ambience and a surviving life. When I was told no, parents were different. So I don't know. I wish I can say it was this because I'm sure it's going to help a lot of other autistics and dyslexic people to find out. And it's not I want to make it difficult. I really, literally, I don't know. Because every time that I talk to him, you have a gift of what? I can tell you, this is a gift. You can tangible, but he never gave me a tangible what he saw. So what's like ability to you? Uh, hmm. What makes someone likable? Two things, you and the person around you. First, I don't believe the first impression has nothing to do with you. You connect the smell, the voice. People is not going to like me as soon as they hear, hey, I'm Susan Ivitz. They're not going to like me. And it's nothing I can do except to find something that we have in common, the me too when we like each other. Likeable is the predisposition, <clears throat> the predisposition to be open mind, to be seen and seen others, to find something in common. They make me like, I like to know more about you and that's where I wanna like you. That moment where like, we like books, we like audiobooks, we laugh together. That's what make you likable. You think making people feel safe is part of that? I'm goofy all over the place. I'm weird. I'm the safest net you're going to be landing. I don't drink the Kool-Aid. I think that can be a possibility because I always start my keynotes or training says, okay, I've been called quirky, this and this. I'm autistic. I'm dyslexic. I'm all over the place. I'm going to have grammatical errors. I don't have all the answers. The only thing I can guarantee you, if I don't have it, I'm going to find someone who does it. People lower the barriers and feel like, oh, if she's not perfect doing what she does, it's okay with me to be gullible and weird and allow myself to go out there. I think I can provide and maybe I'm sure provide or I provide a safe place for people to be who they want to be because that is the platform that I was growing and giving all my life. Yeah, I see it too. You're very transparent, which makes people feel safe. I am. You, I am what you see. Yeah, there's no doubt. That's why it's so much fun to be around. All right. So we go to Austria. We start our, our journey to be the world premier expert in human behavior. What was next? It was like nonstop. I was working nonstop until I was 35. I never take a break. And that was a huge one because I got burned out. I would say for, the only thing I regret in my life is to stop doing political campaign. Mm -hmm. It feels safe. It feels good and it feels made, anonymous. Nobody knew feel, who I want. And I, I apologize for that interruption. No, what made not. you feel what made you feel safe doing political campaign stuff? Because nobody knew who Susan Ivitz was. Mm. I was the dark angel. You're not gonna find pick. I don't exist until three years. You look for me three years before I don't exist. Because I was working on the dark, I working on the shadows. I was working mouth to mouth. I don't need to do videos. I remember the first webinar that I did four years ago. I throw during, before, and after. I hate it. And I procrastinate in doing more material on the media because I don't like it. This box where people use their own dictionary to determine who you are without mm. being in my shoes is completely unfair. I don't like it. How right. people is so mean to others without knowing who they go through. Right. So it was safe. Because nobody needs to know who Susan Ivitz is beside the people who hire me. So I was able to say all the course of words that I want. I can be as weird as I am. Nobody criticize you. It wasn't needed to be politically correct. I am not a politically correct person. Mm -hmm. And I'm okay with that because I'm always strategizing and thinking outside the box. People hire me from that. I can be all over the place. I miss the adrenaline. I miss to see changes. I, mean, I, I like to see how I can mold a person and make it. I never work. One of the things that 
I coach in two political consultants now. The first thing is never, ever work with a candidate you like. Mm. And like, why? Because you start being a bias. If yeah. I like you, it's nothing that I can do to modify, to be likable, because I'm not going to find those things because I already like you. If I don't like you, no matter where is your flag, I'm a mercenary with that and still a mercenary. I love I it. can make you likable. So I love it. your bias, no matter how professional you are, is there. Yeah. So I don't care. I don't need to respect you. I don't need to like you. You can be. And I'm going to make sure that I can find things on you and the people around you to make you likable. If I like you already, we lose. The, we lose already. When yeah. people say, I always work with Democrats or Republicans, I'm like, I don't care. I always work with cases. I was talking you just to work with people you don't like. <laughs> <laughs> Let me put it another way. I love it. I was talking with a trial and a white, white, white crime lawyer. So white crime is when the big three letters call you for something that you did wrong. Uh-huh. And says, I never work with somebody who's innocent. What about you? Like, are you crazy? No way. It's too much pressure to work with somebody who's innocent because they think because the innocent are going to be not liable. The cemetery, the books, and the jail is full of people who is who who are innocent or they were perceived that because they're innocent they're going to win. There's no way. So working with somebody is innocent under the perception just because of that they're not going to be filed liable is not true. It's too much pressure. They think they have their own bias and the perception that is going to happen. Yeah. So the same way I work with politics. So I work with a with a with a client on and 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 law. So and law is like says I don't care if you did it. Don't tell me. I don't care if you did it. Who you did it? What? Who you did it with? Why you did it? How you did it? I just gonna make sure you do what you pay me to do. And most people think I'm a bitch. And probably you're one hundred percent right. So we have this vast experience. I love the insight of taking on clients that you don't like because only you could then make them likable. Mm -hmm. So how do we become the human polygraph? That was an article and it was a lot of controversy and I love it. I went to study. I can't imagine (laughs) that you like controversy. (laughs) Sorry, go ahead. (laughs) I didn't write. Actually, I found out that it's already set it up. So I'm allowed to say it. I, I, you see my passive is going up. Yeah. I, somebody approached to me two months ago and says, I've been reading about you and following on the media. I'm, I'm right from psychology today. I'm going to make an article how somebody with all the odds against her become, should, should become I'm like, you want to write about me using my name? So the article is approved, is coming on March and I'm so nervous and I usually don't say anything until coming. But what says from all the conquers that I did in my life being right about me and how I conquer all the things and I can all the odds against me, they put me next. I stand and Spielberg. I want to see the final article and how no matter how people tell no, it's going to happen. So I went to Europe to study polygraph. And that, that's how you, you and I met because we did a special out the concept right. of the polygraphs. So I want to study another thing that I want to study. So I studied polygraph and I remember I fail horrible. Again, failing is the best tool. And that's how I learned how polygraph work. So two or three years ago, most of the journalists who look for me and they're going to interview me, they don't tell me who is going to be, how we're going to meet or who I'm going to be meeting because they're going to tease you like, okay, tell me something about me. Nobody else knows. So I can read your face and things. So first of all, this journalist happened the same when I did the two front page of Chicago Tribune. I didn't know who I was going to be interviewed. So this guy come to me, I read his face and says, okay, I'm going to start lying to you and you need to tell me how and when. So I let go, go, tell me more. Hmm, interesting. What else? And I was betting him. And we're talking about a journalist who has been in this field for 60 years. And I was taking notes and like, okay, tell me, okay. You like here and here and here. Why? I can see your carrot tie that happened, blah, 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 blah. And you was cringing and doing this. And like, he was like, holy cow, you're the human polygraph. Like, whatever, make you happy. And when the article came up, and like, you, Susan Ivitz is the equivalent of the human polygraph. And I do not believe when people say, I'm a human polygraph, 
or a human lie detector, or you're never going to lie to me, or it's impossible to lie to me, that is the first lie. There are three ways you can be good in this job. Who you are, how you feel in, and how predisposed you are not to drink your own Kool-Aid and walk in a room thinking everybody have a reason, everybody's telling you the truth. I just want to know if you're lying and go with the flow. I'm sure it happened to you, Robin. You have a pedigree that we can work and you can write an encyclopedia. If you go into a room with a bias that the person is lying and not an open mind and being curious, doing questions, like you said in most of the interviews, I didn't use force. I didn't coerce people to be a spies for us. I use kindness. I use questions. I use curiosity. I make them feel safe. We have something called the CSI effect when sometimes you lose cases because the juries are the jurors are expecting like the CSI things fly in the DNA and like it's not true. It's connecting with that person. Let them talk. When you let them talk, they're hanging themselves. But most right. people want to be cocky and not do that. So that's how I did up the human polygraph. Again, I love the title. I think it's fun. They put it on my website. Do I think it's the human polygraph? No. You get me on a Sunday after I went with, with my friends. I hung over. I need bacon and a Bloody Mary. Not talk me about <laughs> inception, detection. I'm the worst. So, Susan... We could talk for hours and days and weeks and months as we will continue our relationship and friendship together. But let's go back to the polygraph a second and leave people with maybe two or three things, not to how to be a human polygraph, because I think you just hit upon something that is the most important that I think resonates with everyone. And that is in order to do those things, you have to be really present. Mm -hmm. What recommendations do you have for people to start being a little more present so they can be a better observer of the things around them so they can start on that journey to being able to detect what someone's doing around them a little more accurately so they can forge better relationships? Don't over-research. When you over-research about something, you're already going, you're looking for the fulfilled prophecy. You're just looking for whatever the person is going to tell you to feed an apostle that you already have that is danger. If I think dating, oh, that guy is perfect. I'm so deceived the guy is not perfect. He never was. Deception coming from your expectation not to be fulfilled for the reality okay. of the person who they are. Deception coming through your expectation. What a great statement. Keep going. Sorry. <laughs> that was fantastic. No, no, no. It's simple. I'm not more intelligent. I must simplify things because my brain needs to simplify. So that's what right. I do with things. So if I deceive, you, you get feel this deception through me, it's because your expectations never going to, I'm never going to feel your expectation. I'm human and imperfect like every other human being. Don't try to make me perfect. Don't put me in a pedestal. Don't do that. I'm not. I'm not a, a, a poster boy for anything. No hero hero story. I'm failed the same way that anybody else. Give yourself the chance. Don't fulfill the prophecy. Not be allowed to people to deceive you in any way because it's your own fault. People don't do the right questions. People don't lie to you. You don't do it. Second of all, being able to listen to the cues. Do not be expecting to look for the next question. Sometimes pauses are the best way you can tech, talk to people is the most uncomfortable thing for you to make and for the other person to receive. But if it says, like you, I was going like, bah, 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 because I'm nervous. I was before the interview, like doing this, like, Robin, I don't like this. And <laughs> you stop me like, wait, wait a minute. Wait, wait, what about Auschwitz? And like, okay, I'm going to need to calm down because I cannot go to get away with this guy. He's going to caught me. So go there and sometimes like, Tell your head, tell me more and how that make you feel and how you that happen and why happen. Be with your body, the tone of your voice and your hands open. If I says, tell me more, like, tell me more. I want to hear more. Be present in your boy in your tone of voice and your words. Don't be critical. And why that happened? Wait, wait a minute. That is not right. No, don't tell people what is right because what is right mm -hmm. for me is not right for you. So be open about the other person. It's not about you and how you want to be talked. It's how the other person needs to receive the information. Ask questions. Be curious. And the third one, do not read, and I know it's going to be controversial, do not buy the book 
for the cover. Wait until re you read the first chapter. Everybody has a story and everybody's gone or went through things that you don't know to. Don't be so easy to criticize and put a finger on another person. Never, never. I love books and I love the analogy. Wait until the first chapter because then you can understand why the title is what it is. Until then, you, you fail. Know the book in your hands. You fail to be curious enough to understand what is the first chapter. And everybody have one first chapter that can allow you to understand where they're coming from. And then you're going to be present all the time. Oh my gosh. I love that analogy. Don't, don't judge it till you read the first chapter. Oh, I love it. It's beautiful. Susan, out of all these great things you've done recently in your life, or maybe even before then, what's brought you the greatest joy? Moving to the forest and doing my 40% of my job pro bono, and you're never going to see it in any, I'm on the board of so many associations, so many things, and taking so much of my time has given me so much joy. And I'm not going to say what it, the way they are. You're not going to see it on the media. And that gave me joy. And I'm so proud of myself to get out of my comfort zone and my lazy buckle <laughs> to, to go and do it for the first time. And feeling it's narcissistic, it's altruistic. I don't care. I have so much joy. I'm so proud of myself to get out of my comfort zone and do it. Joy through service and getting out of your comfort zone. Yeah. Perfect. So Susan, what's something I should have asked you, but I didn't ask you and you wanted to make sure you shared? Nothing. You you are, and you were a really good interrogator. <laughs> <laughs> no interrogation. I hate this. I hate it. People think, oh, but you're not really. No, I hate it. I've been preparing myself all day and keeping BBC, so I don't know. But you make it look so natural and you make it look so easy and it's not. I've been interrogated and interviewed with people like, what the heck are we thinking when I say yes? And I love your show and your podcast because everybody is being interviewed in a different way. Because you use your way to make that person shine. It's not about you. You get the, the guest to be there. So it's nothing. I would say, shut up, Susan. We can make this shorter. That's the only thing you should have done. <laughs> oh, you're beautiful. Susan, thank you so much for coming on and sharing everything. Last thing, where can people go to add a little bit more Susan to their life? You can go to humanbehaviorlab.com or Google my name. I hate it, but I'm, I'm brand. <laughs> so it's go in the to show notes. Yeah, humanbehaviorlab.com and you can find we have videos daily, we have articles, we have newsletter and we have new classes coming. We have web, words, emotions and behavior. It's a new class because I don't think one thing can go together and we are doing crazy things all the time. So take a pick. Awesome. Susan, thank you so much for sharing your amazing and compelling backstory and insights for everyday life, no doubt. Thank you so much, Susan. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Forge by Trust. Remember, if you want to forge trust, it's not how you make people feel about you that matters. It's how you make them feel about themselves. If you're interested in more information about how I can help you forge your own trust building, communication, interpersonal strategies for yourself or your organizations, please reach out and contact me at www.peopleformula.com. I'm looking forward to sharing my next Forge by Trust episode with you next week when we do a deep dive into disciplined listening with Michael Reddington.